Welcome to Mind Boggles. I'm glad you're here. I hope you enjoyed some of the shows we've had in the past. Today we're going to cover an interesting topic called the story of the Buddha. I know a lot of you have different uh, backgrounds and histories of religion and politics and so forth, but the world's getting smaller now. We need to understand other people's traditions, other people's habits. So I thought today uh, we cover the story of the Buddha. And basically this goes back about 2,500 years. Well, let me first of all apologize to the Buddhist community for any mistakes that I might make, but I'll try my best to tell the truth as clearly as I can understand it. Uh, the story of Siddhartha, who became the Buddha, we'll have to go back to northern India about 2,500 years ago or farther uh, to understand the city of Kapilavastu, which was a tremendously popular uh, city. It was full of richness, uh, culture, education. It was peace, prosperity. And the king there, uh, King Sudadana, uh, had a number of wives, one of which was pregnant and was to give birth. And the wise men of his council thought, you know, right now is a wonderful time, it's an auspicious time for the birth of a great king or a Buddha, an enlightened one. Well, the princess gave birth to uh, a young boy, Prince Siddhartha and she died on the seventh day after his birth. In those times it was considered um, a sign that perhaps this is a, a great birth that just happened. Well, a few days went by and one of the great yogis of the court named Asita uh, came to court to see the young prince. And people just got out of his way as he came into the court. And he asked to see the young prince. King Sudadana had the prince brought out handed it to Asita, who held the child. And as he held the child, he began to cry and then began to weep. And the king was, holy mackerel, what's going on here? I, uh, is something going to happen? He was really worried. And finally, Asita gave the child back to the king and said, great king, do not worry. I do not weep for the child. I weep for myself because I will not be here for the teachings of this child. And he left the court in tears. The king was shaken and he thought, oh no, 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 no son of mine is going to be a monk. I want my son to inherit this kingdom. I spent all this time building all this stuff. No way he's going to be a monk. So he called all of his advisors together and they came up with a plan. They said, what we'll do to make sure that this young child will wind up being the next king, will have him live completely within the palace grounds. So for years, King had uh, Siddhartha grow up in the palace grounds, never went outside. He only saw youth, uh, prosperity, health. He was schooled in uh, all types of skills like archery, uh, uh, and taught the, the different types of religious teachings. And sometimes he'd feel kind of melancholy and the king would solve his problems. Eventually, Siddhartha took a wife. And then he had a child. And then the king said, ah, now I've got him. No way he's going anywhere now. He has a son and a wife and he's got to inherit the kingdom now. So his advisor said, you know, they, they, I think you're right. I think this is a good time now to maybe uh, let Siddhartha visit outside of the palace grounds. You know, show him the city of Kapilavastu. So he sent out word to the people in the city, clean up everything. I want everything painted fresh. I want flowers in the street, all kinds of stuff. And they organized the city so it was completely spotless. And Prince Siddhartha on a white horse and his friend Chanda riding behind him. They open the palace gates and out comes Prince Siddhartha, very innocent, uh, young, attractive, and they start going through the city. Flowers on the street, everything's polished and painted. And part of the way through town, uh, he sees an old man. Uh, he's never seen old age before. A very old and decrepit man, and, 
And Siddhartha is shocked. He turns around to Shana and he says, well, what is this? What is this? And Shana says, oh man, oh great prince, this is old age. This is what happens as we get older. And Siddhartha is just absolutely stunned. He can't believe this. He turns around, goes back to the palace grounds. The king is furious. Oh man, this is not supposed to happen. Well, some time goes by and finally they convince the, the king, so, well, well let's, do, let's do this again. We'll go out, this time we'll make sure that the city is perfect. So they open the palace gates one more time. Siddhartha, this time not quite as innocent, starts through town with his entourage behind him. Everything is beautiful, everything is fine. And then he sees a woman ravaged by disease. And he's like, oh, now what's that? And Chan is once again like, oh, great prince, this is disease. We, we don't know what happens, what causes it, but it happens to people when they get sick, they get diseased. <sighs> so Siddhartha goes back into the palace grounds again, just shaken. The king, once again, he's angry, but time goes by again. I'm trying to shorten the story for you here. And they send out uh, the prince a third time. He goes through the city on the third parade, basically. Everything is fine. They almost make it through Kapilavastu, and then a funeral procession goes across the path of Prince Siddhartha. Chanda gets it now. He says, oh, great prince, uh, this is death. This is what waits all of us. Eventually, we live long enough, we die. Siddhartha gets it. He turns and walks the horse back into the palace grounds. This time, that night, he disguised himself as an ordinary citizen, goes over the walls, goes into the marketplace by himself. For the first time, he sees uh, women uh, frightened for their children, trying to take care of them. He sees men arguing for prices on food and, and clothing and, and, and hardware, and, and he sees the hubbub of the, of the marketplace and the uh, anxiety and fear. Uh, and in the middle of all of this, in the marketplace, he sees a monk in peaceful meditation. Hmm. He thinks about this. He goes to his father that night, great king. Father, I've lived in a fool's paradise. You know? I've, I've got to leave and find out the answers to old age, disease, and death. And the king says, oh, Siddhartha, think of all the good you can do by being a great king. All the education, all the things you can do for people. Be, stay here, be a king. And Siddhartha and the king, his father, they argue for hours. And finally, Siddhartha says, okay, father, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I will promise to stay here and be king if you promise me my life will not end in old age, disease, and death. Well, the king said, well, uh, Siddhartha, think of all the good you can do. And he finally, uh, Siddhartha realizes, I'm not going to get permission from my father. That night, late, he kisses his wife and son goodbye as they're sleeping. And he and Chanda ride off, and they ride for days until they come to a forest. And Siddhartha gives the horse back to his friend Chanda and cuts off his hair so he, no one knows it's royalty and tells Chanda, tell my father that I will not return until I find out an answer for old age, disease, and death. And he moves into the forest. And for seven years, he, he stays with people who are supposedly enlightened beings and yogis, and he studies the teachings. He studies the Upanishads and the Vedas. He learns everything he could possibly learn. He tries meditation. He tries all kinds of ascetic uh, austerities. He tries everything he can. Uh, eventually, has five of his own followers, because he's really, really pushing on this whole thing to become enlightened for other people so he can solve this problem of old age, disease, and death. Well, one day he's sitting under a tree and he's trying extreme asceticism, not eating or drinking water or anything. And he, in front of him, there's a river and he realizes, uh, 
I don't have enough strength to get water. About that time, a young girl comes up and brings him water. His followers, who are in the background, they say, hey, our, our, our master has broken his vows. He's a bum, we're out of here, and they leave. And they head back to Deer Park, which is about five weeks' walk. And uh, the young girl brings him more water and eventually starts bringing him some rice and some food. And Siddhartha, as he sits there, realizes, I've tried everything. I've tried education, I've tried meditation, I've tried everything I can think of, and yet a young girl, out of simple kindness, has shown me a path. Right? And he realizes too much or too little is not a good way to go. Too much asceticism, too much pleasure, all those things on the ends of the spectrum make it hard. He has to have a certain amount of health in order to practice meditation, in order to get your mind quiet and still. There's got to be the middle way, which is the Buddha's insight in terms of the middle path. Not too much, not too little, but staying balanced and healthy provides you then the physical ability to begin to hold your mind still, to do meditation without being um, distracted by poor health. And as he sits there, more things start to happen. Finally drops into deep meditation. And so it said after many days in the higher planes, he comes back from the experience of total connectedness with how it is and realizes the solution to old age, disease, and death, and the predicament that we as humans find ourselves. About that time, he says to himself, this cannot be taught. It can't be taught. And a voice behind that says, go and teach. Hmm. Okay. So he begins his walk back to Deer Park to, first of all, to tell his five followers he is now a Buddha, an enlightened one. He sees how it is and will provide a way to escape old age, disease, and death. Yeah? So he walks back. For five weeks, he, as he's walking, he comes up with the, what's called the Four Noble Truths, which is the basic teachings of Buddhism. Uh, and he gets to Deer Park, his followers, out of habit, they stand when he approaches, and he says, sit down, I am now a Buddha. Everybody's going, yeah, right, yeah, he's a Buddha. Look, Fred's a Buddha. Well, who do we know in history when they have said, I am the father of one, don't get hammered, right? So he says, now hold it, Just sit, listen, you know. Do not believe what I tell you, but think about it deeply, because our salvation is in deep, clear thought. Uh, not in belief, which is shallow, but in deep, clear, reasoned thought. Okay, so he says, the first noble truth, my followers, is life is suffering, is it not? Everybody agrees, you know, there's great suffering. Yeah, right, right, well, that would be the first noble truth. You look around and you say, well, there's suffering everywhere. There's anxiety in the eyes of people that we see that are paddling, especially today for us, you know. The economy is kind of falling apart. We're all paddling pretty hard, are we not? That anxiety is a certain amount of suffering. Stubbing your toe is obvious, but just the just general anxiousness that all of us have. There's fear and hope and all kinds of things mixed in there, but it's anxiety. And one of his followers said, well, how about pleasure? And the Buddha says, what happens after pleasure? What do you mean? You have a memory of it, do you not? And that memory of the pleasure makes you want to repeat it, doesn't it? You know? So then you have anxiety until you can repeat it. So even pleasure brings suffering. Like, hmm. So the first noble truth is life is painful. The second noble truth is, well, th there's a disease, we call it suffering and pain, uh, what's the cause of this disease of suffering and pain? The Buddha says the cause of it is desire. We want it to be different. Right? 
The more desires I have, the more I, suffering I have set out there. So the idea is realizing I create my own suffering. I'm the cause of it. I create these desires. Well, is there a medication for it? Well, the third noble tooth says yes. The cause is desire. The way to start eliminating suffering is to eliminate the heavier desires, the addictions. You, you shift from those and you let those go and you move to preferences. Instead of, I have to have pizza tonight, <laughs> so I would like to have pizza, but tonight I got fish. You know? Let me enjoy the fish. So you shift from addictions to preferences. Okay. The fourth noble truth is what we might say, uh, clean up your act. Right livelihood, right action, right speech, you know, right type of things to do. So as we, what we might say, stop doing bad things, start doing good things, right? Which allows us then to do the last little piece of this eightfold path, which is to now your mind is quiet enough to begin meditation. But you can't meditate when you're running from the police. Or Oprah gave you a million dollars, you can't do it, right? So it's preparation, so you then can begin to sit and go deep inside yourself to see what is really going on here. Well, what's this have to do with old age, disease, and death? In many religions, the idea is of what we might call reincarnation. We keep coming back again and again and again. What we sow is what we reap. The Buddha says, as you begin to release desires, and start to calm your mind and open your heart, you then can do your life to be of beneficial use to others. So it's not selfish, it's selfless. And that begins to release the grip of returning life after life. Right? So we don't have to come back here. Catch 22 of the Buddhist teachings is what's called the, um, the Bodhisattva, the vow of the Bodhisattva. So the vote, it's like having your junior varsity Buddha. You almost got your B, you go to the Buddha and say, I need one more piece of advice, and I'm gone. The Buddha says, metaphorically, how can you go into eternal bliss knowing others are still suffering? Okay? So the vow is to keep coming back over and over until all of us can go. Then one of the followers said, no, wait, 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 hold on a second. How about God? How about heaven and hell? How about those kind of things? The Buddha said, have I ever talked about that? Uh, no. Well, what have I talked about? How to reduce the suffering. Yeah. In that sense, from our Western perspective, we think, well, well maybe uh, this isn't really religion. <laughs> you know, there's no idea of heaven and hell. And that's a good argument. Uh, many would argue very successfully that Buddhism is not a religion. It's more of an understanding of how to practice uh, compassion and wisdom to live a life for the benefit of others. Anyway, that's in uh, the Reader's Digest version of the story of the Buddha. He lived to be in his 80s, and he died. With, he didn't leave any followers. He says, you decide your own path, but take refuge in the knowledge we all can become Buddhas, we all can awaken, if we understand how the world works. Right? So hang out together with each other and do your best and take refuge in the work and the teachings and in your experience, not on shallow beliefs. And that's essentially the story of the Buddha. Anyway, that's mind boggles. Hope you've enjoyed it. Until next time, uh, take care of yourself and see if you can take care of somebody else today. Make them a little bit happier. Talk to you later.